don't know if it's the loss of that extra hour or I guess not extra hour, loss of the hour or what, but my mind keeps thinking I'm supposed to be preaching here what I'm supposed to be preaching tonight in Iola. So I almost had him read Genesis 3 and then my mind. So if I start preaching one message and then later on it like turns into a different message, just, you know, just go with it. You know, that must be led by the Holy Spirit or something. <laughs> but I've been talking about uh, last week we started something and I couldn't get it all in one sermon. So I'm going to finish it up today. The lying tongue, the lying tongue. We talked about the fact that some people just are habitual liars for whatever reason. They just are drawn to this uh, addiction, I guess, of telling lies uh, just like addictive behaviors, you know, of, of anything, whether it's, uh, you know, some kleptomaniacs, you know, st- just steal for no reason and, and all these. So lying is one of those things. Then we also talked about, uh, let me put these on here. I forgot to take a picture. So I hope you remember what was on there. Uh, but we talked about um, lying to get out of trouble. We talked about, let's see here, uh, lying. What was it? To get somebody else? In? No, that's today. Uh, uh, lying to get us out of trouble. Lying. Uh, oh, that's right. To make oneself look good. Lying. That's kind of based in pride there. To make. Okay. Now today, we're going to look at lying for personal gain, and then lying (laughs) to get someone in trouble, okay? Now, I have some examples in mind. But on the way up here, uh, I was asking my family, hey, think of some instances in the Bible, you know, where there's lying. Boy, it didn't take any time at all before we found out there's a lot of lying in the Bible. (laughs) The the Bible's full of lies. But (laughs) you understand what I mean. It's full of lies, but the Bible's always true. Uh, So I'm telling you what, just I thought it'd be a good, like, practice for everybody to just... uh, just throw some ideas. So what are some lies in the Bible? And we'll see if they fall in. Maybe we'll come up with another category that I'm missing or something. But just throw something out there. You might have to think about it for a minute. We, we had to kind of prime the pump a little bit on the way up here as well. But some of the big lies. What do you think? But you know what was really hard is trying to find specific, like, like, you know, what was a lie that was told for personal gain or what was a lie uh, like that? But, but you know, once we started going, we found a whole bunch of them. So, well, that falls under this category. That falls under this category. <clears throat> What's that? Oh, like Abraham and then uh, later on Isaac, the uh, lion saying that that's my sister. Okay, so, so what, was, uh, what was the reason for that lie? To get out of trouble, right? I mean, you could say, I guess uh, in that case, you know, they would have been in trouble. It was kind of a, a, a faulty, faulty logic, but they thought they'd get in trouble. And so I'm just going to make some marks here. Right, right. We talked about that one. So, uh, so actually, if you read that text, it actually said, I didn't catch this at first, but she went, Valerie went and read it and it said that they were all going to give her money. I guess I, I missed that somehow growing up. They were actually going to give her money for doing that. And so that was obviously for personal gain. It actually was going to get him in trouble, but it wasn't that she just hated him and wanted him in trouble. She actually wanted the, the, the gain. Yeah. Rahab. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, um, let's see. We talked about that. I don't know if I talked about that here. I think it was actually in Iola. I was actually covering the idea of stealing and I was saying, you know, there are some li- some lying in the Bible that it seems almost like God overlooked. Like in Rahab, it actually says what she did was a good thing. And you're like, well, it was lying. Lying is never a good thing, right? But there were times where somebody would lie, you know, they would, they would lie to save somebody's life or to save their own life. And it almost seems like that was overlooked. And I compared that to stealing. It's like no man despises a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he's hungry, right? 
Uh, now he's still going to pay it back sevenfold. It says he's still going to get, you know, he's willing to do that and have to pay it back. But he, you know, uh, is is in the process, you know, doing what he feels like is necessary to save himself. So maybe that's that kind of an idea. But let's see, what would that fall under even? It was kind of like trying to get someone else out of trouble, but I guess maybe her too. Also, uh, Michael, Michael, Michael. Ananias and Sapphira lying about how much they'd sold. No doubt. Their possession they're given after they sold it today. Lying to the Holy Ghost, that was clearly for, for gain, I guess. <laughs> they're giving, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. That's no doubt about that. What am I thinking? Because because uh, they're not really getting... Is this is this erasable? Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> I had to switch markers. Yeah, they're, obviously, you're not really getting gain when you're selling all your property. But then again, they, they lied uh, to make themselves look good. That's for sure. Judas the Christ. Okay. Uh, like yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. Like telling him that he, you know, like pretending to be a friend and kiss him and all that. Uh let me see here. So that was obviously for gain. That's what you're saying there, okay? And then uh, Peter denying that was kind of to get himself out of trouble, right? He felt like he was, you know, that was going to get him in trouble if he confessed that he was with them. <laughs> yeah, we, we talked about that one. That's great. How about a little bit of milk? Just lay your head right here. I'll take care of you. <laughs> My kids, when I did that, my kids were like, you're trying to make it seem like she was like a psychopath or something. And I'm thinking, you got to have a little bit of psychopath in you to be able to just run, so, uh, run a nail through somebody's head. Uh, wait, what, what was that one for? <laughs> Hold on, I'm, I got stuck here for a minute. What was, we're talking about JL. What would JL, uh, let me see here. Oh, she was lying for, for God's honor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll put it for that one. That seems like to to kind of fit that one. But what were you saying? <laughs> All right. So for personal gain, huh? We... <laughs> That's good. But Tony, once we start going, Cain definitely. You know. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, to get out of trouble. I think we mentioned that one last week, actually. Uh, let me see here. Potiphar's wife. Potiphar's wife. I've actually got that one written down. What was she trying to do? She's trying to get somebody in trouble, right? She just hated him because she w he wouldn't give what she wanted, and so she's like trying to get him in trouble for it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was obviously personal gain, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, make himself look good. I guess. That's the only thing I figure. He's trying to tell, oh, yeah, I, I was there, and I brought you the, I brought you his crown and everything. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, a, I don't know, it didn't work out so good for him, though. What's that? Right, right. So that was kind of like to get himself out of trouble. He was like, uh, he thought that guy was, on, you know, going to suspect him that he was there for a bad reason, and so he made himself spit a little bit and acted like he was mad. <clears throat> that seems to be a pretty common one, obviously, to get out of trouble. People lie. That's still, that's obviously applicable. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure we could sit here all night trying to uh, <laughs> trying to come up with some ideas, but uh, I'll, I might throw a couple in there that we'll, uh, that we'll look at, but maybe your mind just kind of, I mean, don't wander too much. Pay attention to what I'm saying, but, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll think of some more as well. Uh, so the ones we're going to cover today are lying for personal gain and lying to get someone else in trouble, uh, which I almost feel like of all of them, that's like the worst one. <laughs> I mean, it's all wrong, but in some ways it's just like, you know, what is the purpose? You have no other purpose except trying to get that person in trouble. You're not trying to get out of trouble. You're not trying to... Uh, you know, make yourself look good or get personal gain necessarily. You're just, you know, you just don't like that person or something. You had enough. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. They were, uh, they were trying to get him in trouble big time. And uh, in some cases, some of them were trying to get, uh, get reward as well, personal gain. So, yep, yep, that one's uh, one that I thought about in there as well. And so, uh, 
yeah, so uh, a lot of a lot of people throwing out lies in the Bible, and it's funny because several times the Bible says God hates a lying, you know, tongue, and He late, hates those that bear false witness. So, one of the first things that popped in my mind when it comes to lying for personal gain, and obviously this could flow a little bit into trying to get out of trouble. I mean, that's personal gain in a way. But uh, one of the first thing that pops in my my mind is false prophets who just like a greedy, a filthy lucre, you know, and they'll tell lies and all that stuff to get uh, personal gain. Sometimes they're not like, you know, might be pretty decent men who are preachers or whatever, but they're just like, you say they're pretty decent, but they're obviously they have a love for money or something. So they'll even withhold the truth or they'll teach something a little bit differently or whatever, because they don't want it to, you know, affect their, their ministry or, or whatever. And, you know, I remember, uh, I remember having a guy call me up. Well, I had a, the, a preacher I had scheduled to preach, and he called and said, I can't preach for you because you don't believe some of the things I believe. And then I had a guy scheduled to sing with his family, and he called me up and said, uh, uh, you, know, you know, I was talking to my pastor, and, and he was telling me, you believe this, and you believe that. And, and I, so I explained to him exactly what I believe, and he said, yeah, I mean, you know, that doesn't sound that bad. He's like, but yeah, I got I, I to gotta be concerned about my ministry. And I thought, my ministry? I mean, I'm worried about my ministry, God. <laughs> I need to protect my ministry. That's not right. <laughs> that's not right. It's his ministry. Do what he leads you to do. But anyway, that's a, uh, another topic for another day. <laughs> but I think about what the Bible talks about, like false prophets. prophets. I mean, even sometimes just uh, just reprobate, just, just all manner of evil coming out of their mouths because all they want is game. And who would be the first false prophet that would come to mind when you think about that? Joel Osteen. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, but I'm talking about in the Bible. <laughs> you read about it in Jude. Balaam, right? Balaam, for, uh, no doubt, was <laughs> uh, a Joel Osteen of his day. <laughs> okay, so let's go uh, uh, in Jude, what we just read, look at verse 11. Joe, oh, smiley Joe. <laughs> Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. This is different types of uh, uh, false prophets. I remember Brother David preaching on this as well. It says, uh, they've gone in the way of, of Cain. They've greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Okay, so you see he's greedy and you see he wants a reward. And if you go back to the story, you kind of don't see where he ever gets that reward because God's not letting him speak, you know, falsely. He, he's trying to, he, he wants to, he would, if he could, he would speak bad about Israel and he would get, uh, you know, the reward, but he can't. And he's like, I want to, but I can't, you know, it's just, it won't come out. He tries to say one thing and something else comes out. Well, apparently if you keep reading, because the Bible's really consistent talking about how Balaam was somebody who, uh, was greedy a filthy looker. Look also at first uh, at Second Peter two. Second Peter two, verse fifteen. Again, this is a parallel passage, kind of talk, talking about the same thing here. He says, "Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness." So he he's got wages there. I mean, everything is tied to him. It's like he loves the wages, and you're like, well, he didn't even get paid. Well, I believe the, the answer to that is in Revelation 2. Okay, we don't exactly know what he did. Now, you can compare Scripture to Scripture and see uh, probably what Revelation is talking about here. Uh, but he found a way to get rewarded somehow. Somehow he found a way to get money. And that seems to be what wicked people that will just tell lies and everything to get ahead. They'll find a way to get their lie told and they'll find a way to get their filthy lucre. And here's what it says in uh, Revelation 2 verse 14. For I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to, we well, know we're talking about the right Balaam, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things, sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication. So he was, he figured out a way to 
uh, to cast a stumbling block to get them to fall. Since he couldn't pronounce, you know, bad judgment upon them, he was able to convince them and show them a way that they could make God mad at him, basically. But apparently he still got the reward. That's all he cared about. And it seems weird that he would even be called a prophet and that he would ever even speak the words of God, even though he didn't have a choice, when his heart was that wicked that he would just go after gain and just be able to tell lies and all that, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of false preachers uh, today are just constantly telling lies. I mean, some of them are so, you're, you're trying to tell someone, they listen to these guys, and you're just like, how do you not see it? I mean, the most obvious ones are the ones that are like, like Christ is coming back on such and such a day, and then that day comes around. You're a liar. <laughs> God didn't tell you he was coming, that Jesus was coming back on that day. But they said that he was. And then they'll just come up with some kind of like, okay, now I sold my millions of books and stuff like that, and I got my money. So I'll just tell them like, okay, well, I was a year off or something like that. And they'll just keep on telling these lies. Well, the Bible tells us what's supposed to happen when a false prophet does that. Look at Deuteronomy 18. All right, Deuteronomy 18, let's start in verse 19. It says, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's back up to verse 16. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that, that which is wrong, then both the men between whom uh, the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness witness be a false witness or hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought uh, to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put evil away from you uh, from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear uh, shall uh, and, and fear and shall henceforth commit no more uh, any such evil among you. Uh, and thine eyes shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So basically, if you told a lie on somebody that got them in trouble, let's say you convinced the court that somebody was a murderer. Well, what's the charge for murder? Your blood should be shed for their, their blood. And so if you got them in trouble, even if they, they weren't put to death, but your lie that you were telling on them was going to get them put to death, well, guess what your reward is? You get to be put to death, okay? And if you you know, said that, hey, they had stole, you know, two oxen or something like that from somebody and they hadn't, it was a false witness and they found out that you were lying, then you have to restore what he was supposed to restore, which is like, you know, five additional oxen or, or something like that. And so, uh, and so this is, this is the case. Now, uh, uh, I missed the part about, let me see here, chapter, uh, go back to chapter 18, Deuteronomy 18. And now look at verse 19. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, which uh, uh, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord... If the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that, uh, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. That makes sense, doesn't it? But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Look, you told a lie. You said Christ is coming back. He didn't come back. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid to rebuke you or to call you out. You're a false prophet, right? I remember uh, hearing tons of these. Uh, there, it seems like they were all... Uh, uh, charismatic, non-denominational type, uh, mega church or whatever, and they're all coming out and they're saying, you know, God told me that tomorrow COVID is just going to disappear. And they're like, you know, trying to blow COVID away and all this kind of stuff and bring these demons. I mean, not these demons. <laughs> that, that's what they were really calling on. Bring these angels to come and like carry COVID away or something like that. And, and he told me it's going to be gone. And then it's just like, 
Okay, it's still in the news. I mean, I guess you could tell everybody, no, it's in your head. It's not really there because it's gone or whatever. But like when nothing changes, it's like, okay, that guy was lying. He was saying that he heard something from God when he really didn't. Uh, how about Trump? You know, next election, I mean, the last election, uh, I mean, lots of false prophets were saying, God, it's okay. God showed me Trump's going to get reelected. And so don't worry, you know. And uh, anyway, I could preach on that whole subject. <laughs> but so uh, what happens? He doesn't get elected. So now they're probably going to say, oh, no, no, we're talking about like in the next election. So now you got to wait around a little bit to see, look, they're false prophets. They're liars. And what did the Bible say was their punishment? Back then, their punishment was death. You know, that would really, that would really get you, uh, you know, thinking before you went around saying, hey, God told me such and such was going to happen. Because you know if it doesn't happen, you're going to be put to death, right? That's how God felt about liars, particularly those who were telling lies about and saying things God supposedly said, which he really didn't say. And God was really upset about that. And the fact that somebody would do that for filthy lucre, you know, how could, how could you not expect that man's going to be judged very harshly uh, by the Lord? But here is what the Bible says about people who are in a leadership position, you know, pastors and deacons. Look at 1 P Timothy. First Timothy 3. <clears throat> it's talking about the qualifications of a bishop, and it says, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. Okay, this was important for him to put this in there. That you're picking a, a pastor, you're picking a, a, a bishop, it's got to be someone who's not greedy of filthy lucre. Well, how do you know if they're greedy of filthy lucre? Well, if they're just talking about it all the time, that's probably an indication. I was so discouraged. Like I saw um, somebody posted, like, I, don't, I could care less about the stimulus check. I mean, you know, if it's in my bank, I'm going to spend in my bank account, I'm going to spend it. But like, I realize the, the harm that it's going to cause our nation and everything. So, so like, I'm, I'm whatever, but it's supposed to be for helping people through the, the these, these hard times that we're in. Okay. Uh, of course, people are investing in it in GameStop and <laughs> different stocks and stuff like that. Uh, so, I mean, I, that's not true. I, I guess there are a lot of people that use it to pay their rent and stuff and, and, and certainly have hard times. Okay. So I get on Facebook and I'm like, all these preachers are like, well, the ties ought to be up really good here this next week. Everybody's getting their stimulus check. And I'm like, really? I mean, <laughs> that's all you can think about is woohoo, money. These people have money. And what's sad about that, man, is I, I, I've, I've grown up in Baptist churches and it's not just Baptists, it's, it's everybody, but I've grown up in churches where I see like this, this teaching the younger generation that's going to be in the ministry, like teaching them how to be, how, well, if you do this, you'll have bigger tithes. And if you do that, you know, you'll get, you'll get more money and you got to make sure that the people are doing this. And, you know, there was a time like we, we teach here, uh, the, every, we don't, we're not trying to make any money off the ministry. So everything that we have, we're not selling anything. If a guest speaker comes and they've got a book or something like that, uh, you know, they're not going to sell it and say, Hey, meet me after church. And hey, we're just really particular about that. Uh, right. Cause we don't want anybody to have, have that idea. You know, there are some colleges that teach that have taught preachers, you know, don't give anything away for free because you don't want to, you know, uh, uh, cause like a welfare kind of mentality. They have to work for something. And the more that they work for it, they have a vested interest and all that. So you need to make sure people are paying. I'm like, and that's just, that's just asking for somebody to become greedy of filthy lucre. You know, how can I get more money out of them? How can I just, you know, and then the preaching and everything is just directed towards, towards more gain. Wicked. It's really wicked. And the Bible is uh, very clear on that. Look at, uh, Titus, same thing. You're picking a man to be your pastor or your deacon. You want to make sure they're not greedy of filthy lucre. Titus 1, 7. For the bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, uh, not given to filthy lucre. Okay, 1, uh, 11 whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. This is a, something that God repeats a lot. He's, he's got a, a big problem with that. 1 Peter chapter 5.
This is Peter's instruction to the elders there. He says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but as in samples to the flock. So you don't want some guy in there that all he can think about is money and how can we make more money and how can we get, you know, uh, 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 this kind of stuff given to us. And I, you know what? What blows my mind is, you know, as a pastor, I remember I'm trying to think about all these things that I was taught by other pastors growing up, all these things I was taught in Bible college. And I'm thinking, am I doing this right? And there's times in my ministry where, I, you know, I've, only, I've not been the pastor that long, uh, going on three years, I guess. And, uh, and there's times where I've thought, and am I doing this wrong? Am I going to end up like financially like bankrupting our church or something like that? What's going on? But I'll tell you this, honestly, the more that I have the mindset, I could care less about money. I could care less, like whatever. I mean, I, I had a guy one time called me. He was kind of worried. Like, how come you're not cashing my check? How come you're not depositing my check? Or you don't, you don't want my money or what's going on? <laughs> going on? And I'm like, I just keep forgetting. And he's like, well, at least we know you're not greedy, <laughs> filthy lucre, right? The more I have that mentality, the more God just takes care of us. And we have people in our, our church, elderly folks uh, in our church that were big in Iola, I'm talking about, who were big givers. And, uh, you know, th through time, people were saying, hey, they're going to pass away pretty soon. And you got to figure something out because when they pass away, you're going to really be hurting for money. And, uh, and this was the mindset. A lot of people saying you got to do this, maybe save this and, and, and make plans and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? Every time we've lost one of those members because they passed away, or maybe they just, you know, we had some families that moved and went to another church or whatever. God always replaced it, like almost immediately. I didn't have to like finagle a way to get more money or to trick people into giving more, or have a special uh, fundraiser or, or anything like that. And I think if, uh, if people have the idea, hey, I'm going to do everything honestly, I'm going to be upright, I'm going to preach the truth, whether people like it or not, whether they leave and go to another church or not, uh, whether they spread, you know, things about me, which happens sometimes, uh, or not, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to, I'm going to hold to the truth. I'm going to hold to what God uh, says in his word, and he's going to take care of me. And those people who are going after filthy lucre, they're asking for it. It might look for a while like they're getting away with it, uh, but God is never going to bless that kind of a mindset. Very important all throughout the Bible. Uh, he talks about that. <clears throat> You know, uh, a lot of times it's all about, I get worried whenever somebody, uh, you know, writes a book and the next thing you know, you've seen all these pictures of them. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to bring up any names, <laughs> okay, but uh, all these pictures of them like uh, promoting the book and, and just like fancy photography and stuff like this. And, and, uh, and it's some kind of ministry related book. And the next thing you know, his whole ministry is about selling his book, you know, and it's like there's a disconnect and all of a sudden it's just like, whoa, what are you really going after? You know, we got to be real careful that we don't ever get to that point because that's going to affect, this is my bottom, the bottom line, it's going to affect the way that you preach. It's going to affect, you know, your honesty before people if, you're, if your heart is going after uh, filthy looker. Okay? It'll draw crowds, it'll sell books, but there will be uh, repercussions for it. All right, and the Bible says, don't be afraid of those false prophets that, uh, that are greedy like that. Uh, they, you know, they deserve being called out and everything. All right, but not just false prophets, not just people in the ministry. Uh, there are just people who are greedy and selfish people, okay? People, now I have said this uh, my whole life. If I stopped and thought about, like, I don't know, maybe maybe I had just a moment of like getting in the flesh and thinking like, I wonder what I could accomplish if I was just willing to steal, cheat, lie, you know what I mean? I remember, okay, my, I don't know if my wife would remember this or not, but the first time I ran 100 mile, hey, it feels good, doesn't it, when you run 100, you finished 100 miles, doesn't matter how slow you were, you finished 100 miles, you're like, I could do anything. And I told my wife, I was like, man, that gives you this confidence, like, if I put my mind to it and I really try, I can accomplish all kinds of things. And I told her, I said, you know, I think if I had this, if I had an ambition, I want to be a millionaire. I can see where people would just, they'd give their whole life to becoming a millionaire and they would do anything and they'd be willing to lie, steal, cheat or whatever to get it so that they could get it. 
they probably get it. So if you stop and think, like, what could I accomplish in this world? Like, what could I get? What kind of fame could I get? What kind of uh, wealth could I get if I was willing to lie, steal, cheat? You know, you might uh, start thinking that it would work. But of course, as Christians, we know better. <laughs> we know that God's not going to bless that. We know uh, that that's not going to go go well. Okay. Uh, and we know this, we're laying up our treasures in heaven. God's going to reward us far greater in eternal rewards than what we could have possibly earned in this lifetime of being honest, uh, uh, dishonest and going against God and everything. Okay. Genesis 39. So lying for personal gain, just basically filthy lucre is the idea there. But then there's just this lying to get someone in trouble. Genesis 39, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow. Okay, uh, let's start with verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, talking about Joseph, cast her eyes upon Joseph and, said, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wadeth not what is with me in, in the house, and, uh, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is no greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by, uh, uh, to lie by her, to, I'm sorry, to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. That's a dangerous situation. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw uh, that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in in Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard uh, that I lifted up my voice and cried, and he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. Now, what could possibly be her motivation to tell such a lie about this man who's only done good for her husband and for their household and all that, except for she just was mad at him and she just wanted him to get in trouble, you know? And it's really sad that, that people will actually get mad at somebody for something that they did or they'll get jealous about somebody and it'll cause them to want to get back at that person by telling lies about them and getting them uh, in bigger trouble. And, uh, and that's, you know, sometimes, sometimes we lie to get ourselves out of trouble and then we find out that that actually affects somebody else. Okay, that, that is a possibility. But we're not deliberately lying to get somebody in trouble we're just lying to get out of trouble, and then it ends up that that gets somebody else in trouble. Okay, now that's wicked too. In fact, you know, I think a righteous person, if they realize, hey, you know, other people are being affected by this lie, they would get to the point where they say, you know what, I need to stop telling this lie. <laughs> I need to get right. I need to confess the truth. Uh, you know, let me, I'll show you an example. I like picking on my kids, right? But we'll pick on Zachary. He's not here today. Okay. So I remember Zachary... A uh, little kid, must have been maybe five, I guess, because Sharice would have been two, I think. And, uh, oh, I get to pick on Sharice, too. Okay, so she's like two years old or something. I don't even remember what the situation was. Something broke, something, uh, something was messed up, I don't know. And we assumed it was her. And we're getting on to her about it, and she's saying it wasn't her, and you're thinking, you're a two-year-old, you're lying to me. And, and she ends up getting tr in trouble. I think, I think we actually spanked her. And it's not long we notice that Zachary, about five years old, is being really, really quiet. And he's looking down like this. <laughs> and then he comes up to us and he's kind of like, he goes up to Valerie. He's like, Mom, I actually did that. <laughs> 
And I don't remember what we did. Like maybe he still got a spank in, maybe not. We were like, hey, you know what? That that was we want to reward that kind of an attitude. I don't know. Uh, I don't remember what we did. But that's a child, and children, you know, often will be like, yeah, I can get away with. Somebody else takes the blame, and I don't get in trouble. You would think like they would they would take that up, but a lot of times children would be like, oh, that's not right. You know, I don't want them to get in trouble for something that I did, and uh, you know, that's a child. But as adults. Man, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And if we're not careful, you'll allow other people to get hurt, other people to be affected by that. I, 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 hate, I hate sharing this story, but since I'm picking on my kids, I might as well pick on myself. I'm like 17, 18 years old. I can't remember. I'm maybe 17 years old. And, uh, and my mom's here to testify, so I'm going to try not to look at her. And, and don't ask her afterwards for all the details. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm like 17, 18 year old, struggling with looking at things that guys shouldn't be looking at. Okay, that that happens uh, sometimes, unfortunately. It's a wicked thing. I'll preach about it sometime. Okay, and I was struggling with that, and it was found out. But my dad, who was in the ministry, like he was assistant pastor, youth pastor, whatever, there was a guy coming to him who had the same problem. And he was getting advice from him, counsel from him. I don't know the extent of his problem. I just know that this was something that they were going through this process of trying to get this right. And so when it was when it was found out that, hey, I think my son is looking at something he's not supposed to be looking at, it was really easy because it was almost like, was this the act of so-and-so? And it would have been really easy to be like, I don't know who it was, but it wasn't me and allow somebody else to get in trouble. I, this is one circumstance. I can think of so many circumstances in my life where, where this was a possibility. I could have easily, theoretically, walked off scot-free, let somebody else take the blame for it. But I think a righteous person is gonna be like, all right, it's bad enough that I was willing to tell a lie to get myself out of trouble, but how much more wicked it is to lie to get somebody else in trouble? And just be like, okay, let them take the blame for it. You know, uh, we're not necessarily like to get them in trouble, but allow them to get in trouble as a result of me not getting in trouble. Okay. But then even worse than that, I think, you know, okay, you try to get yourself out of trouble. Somebody else took the blame. You just kind of look the other way, pretend like it didn't happen. But the, the amount of deception and wicked heart it would take to say, I'm just going to devise a way to get this person in trouble because I don't like them. <laughs> I'm going to get Joseph, you know, thrown in prison. We know that, that Potiphar's wife was a wicked woman. Well, that's pretty obvious. I'm going to get him thrown in prison. I'm going to get him, you know, maybe she didn't want to get in trouble. Maybe she's thinking, hey, Joseph's going to go tell on me uh, yeah, that I was trying to do that and I'm going to get in trouble. So maybe that's why she told the lie. I don't know. But uh, you think about uh, just many cases in the Bible, you know, Jesus was the one that brought up. That's probably the, uh, you know, a very clear picture of people that they just hated Jesus. They just hated him. They rejected him in their heart. You know, they had a hatred for him. This is why First John says, hey, marvel not if the world hate you. You know, don't be surprised. And John, I think, is 15. He says, he says if the world hate, hated me, they're going to hate you because you're carrying on what I did. And so, so, look, the world oftentimes will try to go after Christians just like they tried to go after Christ. They will tell lies on you. They will try to get you in trouble. Uh, you don't be surprised. Don't marvel at that. But what a wicked heart for somebody to be willing to do that. And uh, and try to try to get uh, you in trouble. Look at um, look at Exodus 32. I mean, I'm sorry, Exodus 23. And some people will just exaggerate, uh, you know, exaggerate some things about people that they despise. Uh, and I'm, I'll be quite honest. This is something it's easy to do. Now we mentioned Joel Osteen. I think he's free game. You can make fun of him. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm not, but. <laughs> but I could easily get to a point where, you know, all my friends are saying something bad about this guy. And I haven't even considered all the circumstances. I haven't even put all the evidence together or anything like that. But these guys, you know what? They could be lying about this guy. They could be lying about him. And so how wicked it would, would it be for me to just get in on their lies? You know what I'm saying? And just jump in on that and start just railing on this person that I know nothing about, right? And how easy it is to do because there's almost like this mob mentality. 
you know, where everybody, you know, hey, just jumps on board with, hey, let's just rail on this guy. Let's talk bad about him. And this is something I find so dangerous, so dangerous. And in the world we live in with the Internet and Facebook and memes, <laughs> it's so easy to be mean with memes and to, and to just like just constantly just be dragging somebody's name in the mud. I'm telling you. There's a time to call people out. There's a time to call Wigan. There's a time to look at the evidence and say, hey, this person, something needs to be done about this person. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying how wicked it would be to like not know the evidence, not really have anything to, know, to, to do with the situation, and then just jump in on the side that's, that could possibly be telling a lie about this guy. Okay, Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 1. Thou shalt not raise a false report, put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous wicked, I'm sorry, unrighteous witness. Deuteronomy 19. This is the verse that I accidentally read in the wrong place. We'll read it again. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for an iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall a matter be established. Wow. That, that actually would eliminate a lot of accusations right there. You know, if people just said, you know, I'm only one guy, you know, there's not a whole lot of evidence or I'm only hearing this from one guy. So I'm just going to be silent on the matter. I'm not going to take a side or anything like that. That would actually, that would actually help. And that's the, reason for setting it up that way. Verse 16, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then, and I've already read this, you already know where, where I'm going. So, you know, what you accuse that person of, that's the punishment upon you for accusing, accusing that person of that. And this was, this was the way that this carried out in the Bible. Now, you know, Again, it's, it's one thing, uh, back in Exodus 32, 1, I'll just read it again, read it again for you. Uh, I keep saying 32, it's actually 23. Exodus 23, 1 says, Thou shalt not raise a false report. And then it says, Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. What does that mean? Well, it's really easy to just bring a friend and say, Hey, you know what? I'm, not, I'm only one guy and they're not going to believe me. I need a witness. And so, you know, will you be a witness for me and try to get that person to just jump in and kind of, fee, you know, just, just confirm that, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that too, and just be totally lying. And he's saying, hey, you're in on that too, you know. You're in on that wickedness as well. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. When I think about that verse, you know, I think about how easy it would be to destroy somebody's, okay, how about destroy somebody's marriage? That's possible. You tell a lie on somebody and then their spouse never trusts them again, you know, and it destroys their marriage. Uh, destroy somebody's ministry? Absolutely. Accuse them uh, that they're guilty of something and everybody is like, oh, that's wicked. And you know this, the world that we live in, uh, fake fake news and all that kind of stuff. How easy it is for somebody to hear something and run with it, and now all of a sudden it doesn't matter if it happened or not. You know, it's just what everybody believes. You know, everybody believes that this person did did that, and maybe they did, right? But the thing is, you don't want to get in on something that could be false, and this is very important. This is why I try. I try. I'm not always good at this. Okay, please understand what I'm saying. But I try to be very slow in calling somebody a false prophet, calling somebody, you know, a wicked person or, or, or say, accusing them of doing these different things. Now they might've done it and uh, cards might be stacking up against them. They might, is that a gambling uh, analogy? I don't even know. <laughs> stacking up. Anyway, <laughs> it might look like the person did it. I try to be slow to just jumping on that. So I try to like listen for myself and get the details for myself and try not to make any judgments on that because I don't want to be guilty of ruining a man's life or ruining their ministry or ruining the, just the image that they have and the other people uh, uh, think about them because 
I'm, I'm willing to tell a lie about them or get in on a lie that somebody else told about them. Or maybe it's not even a lie. Uh, it, it could be just that they got their facts wrong. But, you know, also, here's what it usually is. It's not a, it's not a full-out lie. It's just an exaggeration of the truth. <laughs> okay. It wasn't quite as bad as I said, you know, but, uh, you know, they did do this and this and this. Well, still, you're exaggerating it to get them in trouble and to get other people to not like them for some reason or another. And, and that's, just, that's just as wicked. You know, the heart behind that. And here's what it comes down to. All these things. We're going over uh, the commandments of God on Wednesday nights in Iola. And whether it's stealing, lying, committing adultery, uh, you know, murder. I mean, you name it. All these things, they would just be done away with if we just love people enough to say, I don't want to defraud my neighbor. I don't want to steal from my neighbor. I don't want to tell a lie about my neighbor. I don't want to, you know, cheat on my uh, my neighbor's wife, or let alone uh, cheat on my wife or something. If if we just if we have that mentality, I don't want to defraud other people. Why? Because I love them, and more importantly, I love God. Uh, the second commandment is likened to the first. So the fact that I love people is pr probably based on the fact that I love God to begin with. Okay. And so if I would just love God and love people, I'm not going to try to defraud them. So I'm not going to tell lies about it. I'm not going to jump in on that. So we've got to be really, really careful and slow to, uh, to get in on any of that. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And thank you for uh, uh, just the reminders that we have in the Bible. I'm so glad that you included in the Bible uh, lies that people tell and sins that they commit and the punishments of those sins and and all that that you've given us, Lord, that we might have examples and we might have uh, just uh, uh, illustrations for our own life that we might know uh, what could happen or what will happen if we go down that path. Lord, help us uh, to keep seeking your kingdom first and, uh, and just relying uh, on you to take care of us and to, uh, uh, to recompense evil and all that. I pray, Lord, that you bless this church. Thank you for those here today. I pray you continue to bless. and and uh, help us uh, produce fruit for you. Help us never get to the point where we're barren and unfruitful. I pray that you would uh, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.